twice. Yeah, the first time round is twice, and then it's first one, two, three, and then key change is four. Yes, it's, I know it says in there, but it feels a bit too soon. So yes, <laughs> yeah. No worries. Yes. The bold is the congregation. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to Ridgeway Church meeting here at Sandringham School. My name is Simon, I'm the pastor here. And if you're a visitor with us this morning, it's especially good to have you with us. And we trust that you'll be able to stay around for a few minutes at the end so that we can have tea and coffee together. Just to say about children this morning, uh, there is creche, Bible club and crossway. So preschool creche, primary school Bible club, and Younger Teens Crossway, school year seven to nine, all happening this morning. So when the time comes, we will let you know. And if you're a visitor here with us this morning, you'd like your youngsters to join in, then please uh, just feel free when the time comes. Well, today, as we gather together, we are all about worship. We're all about worship. Uh, and in the last book of the Bible, we're told this. We're told that all the hosts of heaven worship their awesome creator God with these words. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, our Lord and God. Well, we're going to join with all the hosts of heaven who are worshipping our great God this morning as we sing together, all creatures of our God and King. Do stand when the music begins.
very next chapter we read this. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We're going to continue to sing the praises of our God and of the Lamb together now. as we stand. Our great God and Father, it is uh, our duty and our joy uh, to worship you together this morning. Uh, Yet we do so not only as our maker and our judge, uh, but as our saviour and our Lord. And so as we draw near this morning, uh, we do so to receive from you and only because our Lord Jesus Christ has opened the way through his blood shed on the cross. So, Father, as we gather around your throne of grace this morning, meet with us and minister to us, we pray, and we ask it for the praise of your glory. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Please do take a seat. <clears throat> Let me welcome you once again to Ridgeway Church, and uh, hopefully you were given a notice sheet on your way in this morning. That is for you to take away with you, so please don't leave that behind. Please do take it away and make use of it um, this week as you have these reminders about uh, what is going on. If I could just mention a number of things very quickly, please. Uh, firstly, towards the end of our service this morning, we're going to be sharing the bread and the wine together. So a short service of communion for the final few minutes uh, of our service. So just to let you know that that is coming. And uh, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we encourage you to take part as the bread and the wine uh, is passed around. Uh, if you're not there yet, uh, then that's fine. Just uh, you don't need to go anywhere. Just stay where you are and uh, just let the bread and the wine pass you by as it comes round. Uh, just to say that we had originally uh, planned for our second session of uh, Ridgeway Explore to be happening this morning, uh, but for a number of reasons we decided to postpone it till next week, so it's not happening after the service this week, uh, but it will be happening next week, and then session three will still be on the same uh, scheduled date in two weeks' time. Uh, this coming Thursday we have a church business meeting for church members, so if you're a church member please do make it a priority to be there, if at all possible. If it's impossible for you to be there uh, at 8pm at Wheatfield School, then um, please do just send your apologies to Ruth in the church office. And finally, just to say that um, next Sunday morning is going to be our next all-age service. So next Sunday morning, um, creche will be running for preschoolers. Uh, but everyone above that age will be staying in for the duration of the hour that we have together next Sunday morning. So all age service um, next Sunday. Okay, well, boys and girls, yesterday something big happened in this country, in London, not far from here. Yeah? Wasn't anything to do with sport, wasn't anything to do with the weather. Anybody, boys and girls, can you tell me what happened yesterday that was a really big event? Nathaniel. The King's Coronation. Thank you, Nathaniel. Yeah, exactly right. Well done. Hands up if you sat in front of the TV for hours yesterday watching it. Yeah, one or two. Yeah, anybody had a street party or got a street party today or tomorrow? Yeah, a few of us. Great, good. Well... Yeah, boys and girls, it was a big event yesterday, and this whole weekend is sort of around that, really. The coronation of our new king, King Charles. But here's the question, and this is for grown-ups as well. I wonder if there was anything that you saw happen yesterday, if you watched it, that reminded you of our greater king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Was there anything at all yesterday that reminded you of Jesus, and not just for children, but for grown-ups as well. Well, I wonder if it was any of the things that we're about to see now on the screen. So look and listen carefully, and then, boys and girls, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for our new king, and uh, we're going to also give thanks for the Lord Jesus, who is the King of Kings. So look and listen carefully. I think we can leave the lights, boys and girls. On the 6th of May, 2023, King Charles III will be crowned as King. He is the 40th monarch to be crowned at Westminster Abbey. The first one was William the Conqueror, who was crowned all the way back in 1066. Lots of the traditions in a coronation have stayed the same for hundreds of years. During the ceremony, the king makes promises to serve he is anointed with oil. He is given precious objects. And then he is crowned. And we might expect that a king with so much fame and power would demand that we serve him. But King Charles has promised to use his life serving us. When his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, died, he honoured her life of serving others. And then he said, Wherever you may live, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavour to serve you with loyalty, respect and love.
But King Charles isn't the only king who was chosen to serve. The Bible tells us that there is a king of the whole universe who was coming to the world to serve us, King Jesus. Jesus said he did not come to be served, but to serve. And he showed it again and again as he healed the sick, as he ate with outcasts, and ultimately, as he died on the cross to pay the price for all that we've got wrong. King Jesus is our true and forever servant king. And the coronation is full of things that remind King Charles and us that this is true. The king is given the sovereign's orb, a golden globe topped with a cross. It was made in 1661. As we look at this, we can remember that Jesus is the true king over all the world. He also receives two scepters, golden rods with a cross and dove on top. These are based on shepherd's crooks. As we see them, we can remember King Jesus, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Finally, the king is crowned with St. Edward's crown. It is topped with a cross, decorated with 444 jewels and weighs almost two and a half kilograms. When we look at this incredible crown, we can remember King Jesus. His crown was not made of jewels, but made of thorns as he came to serve us by dying in our place. As we celebrate the coronation of King Charles III, let us also celebrate that Jesus is our true and forever servant King. And let us pray for King Charles, that God would help him as he seeks to serve us. We're going to pray together now. So let's bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we do want to pray for our new King, King Charles. We want to pray, our Father, that you would be merciful to him. We pray that daily he would turn his heart to you, his maker and judge. Please would he be a man of true repentance and faith. And as he exercises his duties... Would you give him good advisors to help him? And would he serve us well at home and abroad, as he has promised to do? And our great God and Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, our much greater King. Thank you that he left the very throne room of heaven to literally lay down his life, that we might live through him forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, be our shepherd king this week, we pray. Uh, and as you uh, lead us and provide for us, please would you be working in us what is pleasing to you. And God our Father, please be preparing us all for that great day when the kingdom of this world will have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, now is the time for Bible Club and Crossway. So remember, today we have Crash for Preschoolers, Bible Club for Primary, and School Year 7 to 9 Crossway. So all are happening this morning. Now is the time, boys and girls, for you to leave us, and we'll see you a little bit later on. Uh, well, the psalm writer uh, pens these words as a prayer 
Open my eyes, Lord, that I may see wonderful things in your law. Open my eyes, Lord, that I might see wonderful things in your law. Uh, And this morning we're beginning a a new Sunday morning sermon series in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. Um, And uh, the book of Leviticus is um, challenging for us. It's a challenging read uh, for a number of different reasons. Firstly, it's removed, of course, the events are removed a long way in time. Culturally, of course, the situation is very different. And also, they were in a very different place in salvation history to what we are today. But nevertheless, it is still God's word to us. Still God's word to us. Uh, Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Romans. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught us in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So everything that was written in the past was written for us. But because Leviticus is a challenging book for us, we're going to pray now uh, for ourselves, and then Fraser is going to come and read today's passage for us before we sing again. So let's pray for ourselves as we come to God's word. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you that uh, everything, it is true that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So Father, as we begin uh, to look at this new part of your word this morning, the book of Leviticus, we pray that you would please speak to us, show us more of yourself and more of what it means to know you today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Fraser's going to come and uh, bring today's passage to us. And after he's done that, we're going to sing. And then Charles, our assistant pastor, is going to bring the message to us. Thanks, Fraser. Our reading this morning is from Leviticus chapter 1. That's on page 103 in the Church Bible. Uh, No, it's on 102 in the Church Bible, actually. Um, And uh, we'll be beginning at the start of the chapter. It's um, the section entitled, The Burnt Offering, Leviticus chapter 1. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord... Bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of meeting. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock, either the sheep or the goats, you are to offer a male without defect. You are to slaughter it at the north side of the altar before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall splash its blood on the sides of the altar. You are to cut it into pieces, and the priests shall arrange them, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and legs with water, and the priest is to bring all of them and burn them on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. If the offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, you are to offer a dove or a young pigeon. 
The priest shall bring it to the altar, wring off the head and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out on the side of the altar. He is to remove the crop and the feathers and throw them down the east of the altar where the ashes are. He shall tear it open by the wings, not dividing it completely, and then the priest shall burn it on the wood that is burning on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to God. Thanks, Fraser. Well, we're going to be thinking quite a lot, I suspect, over the next few weeks about sacrifices. Um, And especially the fact that there can be um, no fellowship for us with a holy God without sacrifice. But of course, the most important uh, sacrifice of all has done not by us, but has been done by God himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And before Charles comes and speaks to us from that passage, we're going to sing of that together now. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Let's sing together.
Amen. Do take seats. Well, as Simon has made uh, clear, we're starting a new series in the book of Leviticus uh, this morning. Now, Leviticus uh, might be the forgotten book. Uh, It's a book we've probably read if we're doing one of those read the Bible in a year plans. Um, I know that often is the case with me. Um, And even then, it could be a struggle. I imagine we don't sort of go through 15 chapters of Exodus talking about how the tabernacle is going to be built and then find ourselves feeling great joy at looking at Leviticus. Uh, It just seems to be a long list of offerings, rituals, laws, uh, people with blood on their ears and their feet. Uh, Talks of animals with hooves, bodily fluids. It's pretty easy to get lost in the trees uh, with Leviticus. We can get lost in the trees. So for the first part of this sermon, we're just going to zoom out. Uh, We're going to see kind of what's going on with Leviticus uh, and why it's worth preaching on and through. Um, We're going to go to chapter 16 in this series for the Day of Atonement. So we'll be covering half the book. Uh, Just look again with me at the first couple of verses we read from Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus 1 verse 1, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. Okay, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. That is actually a big deal. Okay, given what's happened in the Bible storyline up to that point, this is a big deal. Um, If you want to understand a story, one of the best ways to understand what's going on is to find the problem in the story, the point of tension that needs resolving. And in the first five books of the Bible, what's called the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis to Deuteronomy, the problem is fairly obvious. The story begins in in the wonderful days of Genesis 1 and 2. Humans and God living together in the Garden of Eden, a space where God could walk with his people a place of bliss and harmony. But of course, in Genesis 3, tragedy strikes. Sin is let loose because Adam and Eve listened to the serpent rather than listening to God. And it's not just that the world and them are cursed. The biggest problem is that they are told to leave the garden. They have to leave the garden. They can't be in God's presence anymore. Uh, God actually puts a cherubim, an angel, uh, at the entrance, With the firm message, there is no way back. They can't go back to the Garden of Eden. So ever since then, there's been a burning question. How can humans be back in fellowship with God? How can fallen people live again with a holy God? And when we see that that's the problem, it helps explain, for example, why the book of Exodus doesn't just finish when the Israelites cross the Red Sea. Okay, we think that should be a great finishing point. What a great rescue. But then you've got a lot more about building this tabernacle. And the point is that they aren't just saved out of Egypt for the sake of it. They're saved for a reason. Uh, we're going to see a few verses come up behind me from Exodus. There's a lot of these. About seven times God makes it clear why he's saving them. He says, let my son go so he may worship me. Let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. So the point of bringing God's people out of Egypt is so they can gather around God again. You could almost say Leviticus is the point of the Exodus. Exodus happens so that Leviticus can happen. And for many reasons, therefore, people saw Leviticus as the heart of the Pentateuch, the central book of the first five books. Uh, You can also tell that by the time frame. Um, The first five books of the Bible narrates kind of thousands of years of history, But from Exodus 19, when the Israelites get to Sinai, through Leviticus, all the way to Numbers chapter 10, we're concerned with just one year in the life of God's people. One year. Time slows down completely. And it's a way of saying what's happening here is really big. It's huge. Uh, Before that, God only spoke up on mountains or through messengers or from burning bushes. But now a tabernacle is built in the middle of the camp. It's a huge tent. 
Um, it was decorated on the inside with images of creation, of trees. The point being that Eden has returned. Eden is once again in the middle of the camp. And God's presence fills the tabernacle and it becomes a tent of meeting. A tent of meeting because that's where God and humans can meet again. But, as much good news as that is, there's also a problem. The problem of a holy God. Uh, Notice in verse 1 that the Lord speaks to Moses from the tent of meeting. In other words, Moses can't go in there yet. Even Moses can't go in. He can't fully go into God's presence. So all the house rules we find in Leviticus, all these offerings, sacrifices, laws and rituals, they need to be set up to enable the people to meet with God, to come into his presence. Why? Well, because a lot has changed since the Garden of Eden. Most importantly, humans are stained with sin. Because we're stained with sin, we can't just approach a holy God. Uh, when we say God is holy, what do we mean? We just mean he's, he's absolutely pure. He is goodness itself. He's set apart in a category of his own from the rest of us, from the rest of creation. And that means that having God amongst them is both a great blessing, but also a great risk. Uh, someone said it's a bit like uh, living near a nuclear reactor. Uh, nuclear energy has uh, enabled us to do many great things. It's enabled us to go into space. Um, radiation and a lot of medical imaging helps locate problems in our bodies and kill diseases. Uh, radioisotopes help obtain physical evidence, which leads to fighting crime and catching criminals. There's a lot of good that can come from nuclear energy. And God's goodness and purity can really spread and bless his people. But you can't just waltz into a nuclear reactor. If you do that, that's going to spell danger. And actually, God's proximity to his people poses a danger. A danger of mixing our sin with his holiness. And you find that in the book. There's two little sections in the book of Leviticus that are narrative. Most of it is kind of laws, um, talk about offerings and sacrifices, what to do. But there's two main sections of narrative which stand out. And these highlight the two problems. Uh, One of the narratives has two priests approach God in the wrong way in the tent of meeting, uh, and they end up dying. Later on, some commits a moral sin, and he also dies. The point being, the Lord is with them, but that has the potential for either blessing or death. So for the Israelites and all of us, as we read these offerings, these sacrifices, these rituals, these laws, it's like someone taking a pen and underlining the sentence, the Lord is holy. We have to take him seriously. Leviticus is preparing people to live near the Lord, but to survive that encounter. To be able to survive that. Last thing to say about Leviticus is uh, grace. Okay, we need to remember grace. Uh, It's interesting that Jewish children, this would be the first book in their education that they would read. It's the first book they'd read. Uh, To the Israelites, the book of Leviticus was not a burden to kind of wade through, a bit like how we feel about it. For them, it was a joy. It was about something extremely gracious and life-giving. It taught them about a God who didn't just abandon them, even though that's what they deserved but he made a way for them to be able to live with him. So we see grace here basically in two, two ways, which are really key. First thing to remember about Leviticus is all these rituals, all these sacrifices, all these laws, they're for people who are already redeemed and saved. They've already come out of Egypt. They're not being told, do all these things and therefore be saved. They've already been saved. They are God's son, his chosen people already. Someone said it like this. Far from setting aside the promise of grace, the law was given to those who had been saved by grace in order to show them how to live in that grace. It's showing them how to live in that grace. Second thing about grace here. All these instructions given are given on God's initiative. 
He's the one who brings all this about. It's done so his people can live and experience blessing with him. All these offerings, all these rituals, all these laws, this is God saying, this is how we're going to keep the relationship going. Again, he didn't have to do that, but that is what God's saying. Even though you're full of sin, I'm going to make a way for our relationship to flourish. It's very gracious. And it works. By the time we get to chapter 9, we'll see that Moses and Aaron can go into the tabernacle. They can go in fully into God's presence. They can draw close to God and survive. So the final thing to say is just that Leviticus is very relevant for us. Okay, it's very relevant for us today. Uh, although the rituals and the tabernacle, the offerings, they're long gone, the God that they reveal is the same God. It's the same God. He is holy and he is very gracious. He is a God who wants us and has called us to himself. It's the same God. And we also haven't changed. Okay, the Israelites were God's chosen, redeemed people. And now they've been directed how to worship him and live out a life of love and obedience. And that's the same for us too. If we're Christians here today, we are Christians because we've been redeemed by the Lord Jesus. And we are also called to live out a life of love and obedience. So what we read here is very relevant for us. So that's a bit about the overall book, what it's doing. Now for the moment you've all been waiting for, the burnt offering. So, the burnt offering. Uh, the burnt offering was the first of five offerings. Uh, it's actually perplexed many people, the burnt offering. I'm trying to work out what exactly is it for. Um, it has a variety of uses. Uh, we see it happening actually before Leviticus. It's what Noah does when he leaves the ark in Genesis chapter 8. Uh, the Israelites do a burnt offering when they get to Sinai. We read about it in the Psalms. It's basically the most common offering. Uh, there was a special altar built in the courtyard of the tabernacle for this burnt offering. And we read in Exodus it was meant to happen day and night. Day and night. You could say, I think, it was a way for people to come and offer thanks and worship to God. It was a way to come and offer thanks and worship. Uh, it makes sense of the fact that it, was comp uh, it wasn't compulsory, it was voluntary. When you come and do this. Uh, the passage we read is in three sections. Uh, basically, each lists what one is to bring if you don't have the particular animal that it's talking about. So if you don't have a cow or bull, you can bring a sheep or a goat. If you don't have a sheep or a goat, you can bring a bird, a dove or a pigeon. Basically, this offering is for everybody. Whether you're rich or you're poor, God has made a way for anyone to come to him and give him worship and praise. Anyone could come and do this. And there's two important things, I think, for us as we look at how to worship and how to approach God. Uh, and the first thing is this. We come through the death of another. When we come to God, we come through the death of another. Let me read and look down with me from verses 3 to 5 of chapter 1. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord, and then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall bring the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And just look down with me at verse 9. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs of water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Uh, in 1982, uh, famously, a guy called Michael Fagan managed to slip into Buckingham Palace. Uh, I don't think you could do that now. Lower security back then. He got in. Uh, he actually made it into the Queen's bedroom. Uh, now, that obviously was not the right way to approach the late Queen um, if you wanted something. Uh, he found that out when he was promptly arrested by lots of policemen. The Queen, because of her status, you can't just go into her bedroom. Can't go into a palace like that. 
Now, with Leviticus, it's not just that God is bigger than us. It's that God is holy. Okay? He's pure. Approaching God required the shedding of blood to come before him. Why? Well, because of our sin. Because of our sin. You can see that in the details about what one needs to bring. You have to bring an animal, but not just any animal. You bring an animal without defect. That means an animal that's pure and spotless. Why? Well, because to approach the Lord, you kind of need to change places with the animal, as it were. You're going to switch places. By laying your hand upon the animal, you're identifying yourself with the animal. This is going to represent you. Um, It appears that then the offerer had to cut the throat of the animal, uh, if it's a bull or a sheep or a goat, and then the priest splashed the blood against the altar. The animal's life is taken for your life. That's why it's referred to as making atonement. Um, Atonement is literally at one meant. At one. It's about fellowship with God, being reconciled to God. That's what we need. That's the purpose of this, is to be reconciled with God. Uh, When the offering was burnt, notice the sort of smoke and the aroma go up into the heavens, as it were. Um, As it were, the animal is transferred from here into heaven. And because the offerer has said, no, this animal is me, symbolically it's saying the offerer is kind of returning to the Lord. The offerer can enter the Lord's presence. Um, just, a notice, uh, just a note about the pleasing aroma. It's not that the Lord is pleased that an animal has to die. It's not that. Rather, what's pleasing to the Lord is what the sacrifice means. It means that sin is forgiven and it means that there is devotion to him from the offerer. That's what's pleasing, not just the death of an animal. But all this is communicating that we have to approach God in the way that God tells us. Uh, You need to come through the death of another. Sin is serious, but God provides a substitute. God provides a substitute. And that's also true for us, isn't it? That's true for us. Blood was spilt, a body was offered up to God on our behalf. And that was the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. Actually, Leviticus helps us see what is going on when Jesus dies. We come to God now through the battered and bloodied figure of Jesus on the cross. And he should have been us. But he took our place as a sacrifice. And because of that, we can come to God pure and spotless. Because Jesus was pure and spotless. And we come in him. Um, We'll be looking more at how these sacrifices relate as we go through the book. So we're not going to dwell on that point um, really now. But if you're here this morning and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, if you're here and you would say, oh, maybe I'm exploring what Christianity is about, what this says is that we can only approach God in the way he tells us. We can only come to him in the way he tells us. And that's actually to protect us from coming to him in the wrong way. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 4, the apostles are talking about Jesus Uh, And they say this about Jesus. They say that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We come to God through Jesus and his sacrifice for us. That's how we get back to him. Either you give your sin to Jesus or you face God with your sin in the future. That That is the choice. What about for Christians? What's the application for Christians? Um, That's basically the next point, the last point. For Christians, we come to offer our all. We come offering everything. Uh, Just look down at me at verses 6 to 9 of chapter 1. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron the priest are to put the fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fats, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs of water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. 
It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Uh, the sort of unique thing about this burnt offering that makes it different from the others is that everything is burnt up. That's kind of why it's called the burnt offering or the whole burnt offering. Other sacrifices, sometimes the priest got a bit of the animal for themselves. Sometimes the offerer got to get some of the animal back to eat. But with this, it's all offered to the Lord, all of it. The best of the herd or the flock or the best dove or pigeon is given entirely to the Lord. The point being, this is a very costly offering. It's a costly offering. As an act of worship and gratitude, this is a very expensive thank you. It's an expensive thank you. Um, cows and sheep and pigeons were currency back then. If you wanted to know who's rich in Israel, you would count their cows. Um, I once went to the butcher. Once went to the butchers. A few years ago, I went to the butchers um, when we were back with my dad for a, a family Christmas. Um, I, I went to get some steak. I, I, I didn't really know much about steak. Um, I just said, "Can I have a sirloin?" Uh, turned out to be sixty pounds. Sixty pounds. Now the cost there, I have to make clear. Uh, my dad actually gave me his credit card, so he paid the cost of that. Um, I've never actually been sent back to the butchers since that. Since that, but sixty pounds for a sirloin steak. Imagine a whole cow. The best source of potential income for these guys was given wholly to the Lord. And the point of that was to say, this God and King is entirely worthy of this costly devotion. That God and King is entirely worthy of this. And again, the context is crucial here. Okay, the Israelites are not doing this so they can earn favour with God at some points. Now, these are made by people who've already earned his favour, or not earned his favour, they've already got his favour. They've been saved from Egypt. These guys probably still bear the scars on their face and hands of their brutal Egyptian slavery. Maybe they still have nightmares of the Egyptians chasing them down the wilderness. But they came through the sea. God brought them to himself. They're totally safe and free. God has already done that. They are his children for no other reason than his love and grace. They have so much to be thankful for. So what's a cow, even their best cow, what's that compared to what the Lord has done for them? And friends, we're the same. Okay, the cows and the sheep and the pigeons are gone. But what do we give? Well, Paul tells us what we give in Romans 12. And this is taken straight from Leviticus in Romans 12. He says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Right, humans love to worship. Um, even costly worship makes sense in the society uh, where it's not God, but something else is worshipped. Uh, recently, we had a, what we thought was a gas leak. Uh, it turned out it wasn't a gas leak. It was just a faulty dehumidifier. Um, if you think why we thought it was gas, they do smell quite similar. Anyway, this gas guy came at about 10 p.m. Um, and he, we were chatting. He told me that for about 20 years, he went to every single England football match, home and away. Okay, this guy didn't have loads of money, but he spent most of it traveling around Europe, going to places like Japan and South Korea for the World Cup to watch every single England football game. That's a huge amount of money and time <laughs> spent on that. Uh, if you think about the coronation yesterday, apparently some people were camping out for 10 days before the coronation started, living basically on the street because they wanted to be in the front row to see the king go by. Ten days in a tent. Some with kids. We kind of know it's good to have a passion for something. Even a costly passion. It's good to sacrifice something for something we really love. And if the world knows that and feels that, how much more true is that for us as Christians? Because of Jesus' sacrifice for us, we have everything. We have mercy, forgiveness. We're his children and heirs. 
We have an inheritance that will never spoil or fade. And so we're called to offer our lives, our bodies, as sacrifices, as worship to God for what he's done. Now that can be hard if we're not aware of the true spiritual reality around us. Uh, You might be thankful this morning, like I am, that you don't have to face the gore and the blood, the guts, the smells of the sacrificial system. I used to faint in biology class. I was a bit squeamish. But what that did was it powerfully reminded the Israelites about true spiritual reality. That their God is the most important person in their lives. That he is a holy God. Sin matters. But there is a way to come back to him. And if we're not careful, we can slip into forgetting about true reality. That God is out there. That God has a call on our lives. That he is king. That he has bought us with Jesus' blood. That we are not our own anymore. That he calls us to live a life of gratitude and obedience. We can forget that. Especially in a world that thinks Christian worship is a bit of a waste of time. It's a bit of a waste of time. Uh, I think 2019, there was a guy called John Allen Chow. Uh, 26-year-old, you know, young guy, uh, went to some island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, was killed by a tribe there. He was trying to reach with the gospel. Uh, and for whatever reason, that story caused a bit of an outcry amongst the media His father was furious, thought, what a waste of life. And he blamed what he called extreme Christianity. Christianity that taught this guy that we are called to go and love and serve and give our lives to God and to others. Everyone thought, what a waste of life. But was it really a wasted life? Some people think similarly about doctors. You spend so much money and time earning and going through uh, all the training and then a lot of them go and live in Africa they go and care for patients with Ebola they go and give their lives and people think what a waste all their training but is that a waste Uh, we just finished going through Mark's gospel and Mark Mark loves to put a spotlight on people he thinks are true disciples because of their costly devotion. You might remember the woman who brings a jar of perfume to a dinner party and pours it all out on Jesus. And people think, what a waste. That perfume was uh, worth about a year's wages. And she just wasted it on Jesus. But Jesus did not think that was a waste. Quite the opposite. Uh, Many probably thought the widow with her two coins in the temple offering was wasting those coins by giving it to people. But Jesus didn't think that. He didn't think that was a waste because she did that for God. Uh, Many people probably thought Joseph Arimathea was wasting his career prospects by standing up for Jesus and going to Pilate and asking for Jesus' body. But again, was that a waste? The apostles pulled out their life for their churches and often lost their lives. And Paul boasts about that. That's not a waste. All of these things aren't a waste because it wasn't a waste for Jesus himself to come and give his life for us. That wasn't a waste. Costly sacrifice is what God has done for you and me. Which is why the normal Christian life is a life of costly sacrifice. It's never a waste what you do for Jesus. So let me ask you as we close this morning, is God everything to you? Or is he more of an afterthought? If I was to follow you around for a week, um, not in a sort of creepy way, if I was just there, if I was to look at uh, what you spend your money on, would you spend it more on the things of God and his kingdom and other people, or would you spend it more on things for yourself? Your time, would you spend time doing things for God and his kingdom and being with God? in his presence, or would you spend more time doing things just for yourself? If you're tired every week, are you tired because you're serving him, or are you tired running after the things of this world? 
And you should ask the things, those things of me as well, if you follow me around for a week. Those things are good, but the point here is, do we give God our everything, or do we just give him the leftovers? Would the world think our devotion looks costly, or would it look stingy if they saw it? Are we bringing our best cow, or are we bringing something we don't really mind giving up at all? What are we bringing? Are we burning a little bit, of, a little bit for God, or are we burning everything we can for him? That's what the burnt offering asked us this morning. And many of you give loads for God. That is very clear. But maybe this morning you're wondering, maybe I could give some more. Maybe I could give more. And if that's you, what we need to do is we need to think deeply on the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. He is the true burnt offering. He is the one who loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Jesus answered the call to give his life as a sacrifice. We're called to do the same. Let me end by just reading the last verse in the bleak midwinter. I know it's not Christmas. Uh, In the bleak midwinter is a a kind of strange carol. talks a lot about snow. Uh, And we think, why does it talk so much about snow? But the last verse is good. Let me read it to you. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him. Give my heart. Are we giving God our hearts? Our deliverer, our redeemer, our king is worthy of that. Is that what we're giving him? Well, we're soon going to take the, uh, the bread and the wine remembering Jesus' costly sacrifice for us. Uh, Before we do that and before we pray, let's just spend a moment of quiet reflecting on what we've heard, reflecting on what he's done for us and what we can do for him. So let's do that now. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Heavenly Father, help us to think deeply on the sacrifice of your Son. Thank you that you are a God who gave him up for us. And as we dwell on that, as we live it out in our own lives, help us to give our lives to you. May it be a pleasing aroma to you as we give our all for the one who gave us all things. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
the Apostle John writes this in his first letter. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's what we're remembering this morning as we take the bread and the wine together. And we're going to remind ourselves of what we're doing as we sing a song together. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us, and remember. Please do stand when the music begins. Please do take a seat. And Baba and Jonathan are going to come and join me at the front. 
Um, chaps, if you've got a yellow card, do bring it with you. If you haven't, you can share mine. So Baba, Ruth, um, and Jonathan, do join me. Well, um, this table and this meal is both um, inclusive and exclusive at the same time. It is inclusive uh, in the sense that access is not limited to this table according to any uh, normal human criteria of class uh, or colour or gender. It is an inclusive meal because the death of Jesus is for all. Uh, but at the same time, it is also an exclusive meal. Uh, it is only for those who repent and believe the good news. And an essential part of repentance is confession. And we're going to give ourselves the opportunity now to confess uh, our sin to Almighty God. Uh, the words are going to appear on the screen behind me, uh, or you may have one of these yellow cards that you were given on your way in. Uh, and I like this uh, confession because it's thorough. So often with our confessions, we can just quickly whiz through them and not really give any thought. But with this one, we can't help but give thought to what we're saying um, because it is really quite detailed. Uh, you'll see from uh, what appears on the screen that some of the writing is in bold. Is that right, Josh? Yeah. And some is not. The writing that is in bold is for all of us to say together. And the other writing is just for, for me to say. So bold all together. So let's remain seated and let's uh, confess our sin together. So to begin with all together. Holy and righteous God, we confess that like Isaiah, we are a people of unclean lips. But it is not only unclean lips we possess. We are a people with unclean hands and unclean hearts. We have broken your law times without number and are guilty of pride, unbelief, self-centeredness and idolatry. Affect our hearts with the severity of our sin and the glory of your righteousness as we now acknowledge our sins in your holy presence. We have had other gods before you. We have worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. We have sought satisfaction in this world's pleasures rather than in you. We have loved to praise our own glory more than yours. We have taken your name in vain. We have prayed religious prayers to impress others. We have uttered your name countless times without reverence or love. We have listened to others use your name in vain without grieving. We have murdered in our hearts. We have often destroyed our neighbour with our tongues. We have been quick to uncharitably judge others. We have considered revenge when we were sinned against. We have committed adultery with our eyes. We have loved temptation rather than fighting it. We have lusted after unlawful and immoral pleasures. We have justified our lusts by using the world as our standard. We have stolen what is not ours and coveted what belongs to others. Our lives overflow with discontent, ungratefulness and envy. We have complained in the midst of your abundant provision, we have sought to exalt ourselves through owning more. We have lied to you and to others. We have told distorted truths, half-truths and untruths. We have despised the truth to make ourselves look better. Even in our confession, we look for ways to hide our guilt. O oh God, we have sinned against your mercy times without number. We are ashamed to lift up our faces before you, for our iniquities have gone over our heads. 
If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? How shall we answer you? We lay our hands on our mouths. We have no answer to your righteous wrath and just judgments. Listen to our Lord Jesus Christ's words of assurance to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The Apostle Paul says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Apostle John says, If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has promised forgiveness to all who repent and have true faith in him, be merciful to us, pardon and set us free from all our sins, Strengthen us in his service and bring us to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask Jonathan to give thanks for the bread, which represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. Our Father, we come indeed to thank you that you provided, as it were, your son, who gave himself to rescue us from this present evil age Mm. and to bring us to yourself, that we might be restored to you in fellowship. Mm. We thank you for such mercy and such kindness. And we thank you that we can gather together as people who have been brought to yourself to remember him, our Lord, who gave himself for us. And as this bread is distributed, we pray that for all of us who have confessed him as our Lord, that our hearts will be filled with gratitude for all he has done. Amen. Amen. For on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body given for you. If you are here um, this morning, and you are somebody who is daily turning from your sin to your saviour, then as the bread comes round to you, do tear off a piece, and do hold on to it, and when we've all been served, Um, we'll eat together. And may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul to eternal life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. And if you need bread that is gluten-free, then that is in the small dish on each plate.
Okay, well, now that we've all been served, let's eat the bread with thankful hearts. to ask Baba to give thanks for the wine. Thanks, man. Shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you for the uh, privilege we have to fellowship together mm. and to participate and partake of this wine. Mm. as a remembrance of what you offered to us before you went back to heaven mm. and you told us to do this in remembrance. I want to thank you, Lord, for even a reminder today about the fact that our inadequacies are so obvious, <clears throat> but your grace is sufficient. Mm. And I pray, O oh God, for each of us that participate, that Lord will get a renewal of our commitment to you, a renewal of our fellowship with you, and that we desire, Lord, to continuously reflect on our lives, to see those areas that, Lord, we need to continue to change and be transformed in your likeness. Thank you, Lord, for the gift that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. If you took the bread when it came round to you, then please also take the cup, and this time drink it uh, in your own time, uh, mindful that, that Christ died for you individually as you take the wine. And may the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your body and soul to eternal life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, of which these are powerful symbols. 
Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out into the world in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just before we sing a final song together, uh, a couple of notices. Firstly to say, don't forget we're meeting this evening at 6.30 for one hour next door here and we're looking at the next in our Brave New World series of messages. And um, the other thing to say is that uh, we need to leave the chairs out today. We're not putting them away because the school need them uh, on Tuesday. So please don't stack up any chairs. We're leaving them out this morning. So we're going to close by singing together of the Lamb who has been slain for us so that we could have fellowship forever with our living God. I will sing of the Lamb. Let's stand and sing together.
peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us always. Amen.